when, when we were uh, back again, teenagers, me and the, me and my friends, we used to uh, leave town on a Friday, and uh, we would just like hitchhike out of town. We would have sacks full of dope, and we'd be all f-ed up, and, and and we would leave town, and and they become these bizarre little nightmare journeys that would last for a few days, where we would find ourselves stealing boats on Rice Lake and then breaking into cottages on an island then getting chased by cops to a barn and then these weird like you know bald bald children chased us with axes and and you have these kind of like strange nightmare experiences and then at some point you're going to go back to the city and you know start your miserable life up again Hello everyone and welcome to Nocturnal Horrors. My name is Sean Maserol and today I have a review that is going to be all frickin' over the place. I had all of these really weird, fragmentary, you know, non-linear pieces, moments uh, that I was obsessed with. Pontypool Changes Everything from Tony Burgess is a novel about a virus that spreads through a small Ontario town called Pontypool. It's actually the second book of the Pontypool trilogy the first being Hellmouths of Beaudley, and the last being Caesarea. When Burgess was growing up in the suburbs of Toronto, he had dreams of becoming a visual artist, drawing and painting. That was the direction he always figured he'd go. He would sometimes supplement his artwork with the written word. His work appeared in art galleries, and he had shows in his early 20s. In the 1970s, his life was a mix of the art world, punk clubs, and creating several bands. On the weekends, he and his friends would travel to other towns for a drug-induced journey that would always turn into these nightmarish three-day vacations. Years later, these travels would become the collection of shorts known as Hellmouths of Beaudley, in the first book of the Pontypool trilogy. Although Burgess wanted to be an artist, he realized he was drinking way too heavily when he was creating art on these huge, gigantic canvases, and he knew he had to detox. That's when he created a quieter lifestyle for himself and started to write, and he hasn't painted since. But it wasn't just Hellmouths of Beaudley that had these fragmented, non-linear moments. It was Pontypool Changes Everything as well. It's this cut-up human consciousness, William S. Burroughs thing he had going on in the second book of the trilogy. The one that the film is supposedly based on. You have characters you follow and follow, and then abruptly, they disappear. This happens several times. These are the characters you think are the main protagonists, and what becomes of them is absolutely nothing. You get Grant Massey for a sprinkle of time, and you only hear him on the radio for a brief nanosecond. You get more of him getting sexual favors from his male and female interns than you do of him actually performing on air, or even learning about who he is. What you do get from him is that he is a complete a-hole, and not the a-hole type that you're like, I can kind of get on board with this because he's standing up for something he believes in. No, 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 no. Complete a-hole. There's nothing likable about him in this book. And actually gets himself killed pretty harshly by a brother-sister combo who eventually live off raspberries and zombie flesh long enough to have sex, make an inbred baby that can run as fast as a gazelle and use the F-bomb as soon as it comes out of the womb. Weird, right? This book even has this thing called the higher power. Do not ask me exactly what the higher power is or what the point of it is because honestly, I don't know. And I bet if you ask the author, he doesn't know either. I really don't think he knows. Although he does finish the book pretty much with the higher power, so maybe he has a better understanding than I do. I hope so. So with the first book, the collection of shorts, the publisher goes to Burgess and says, let's do a two book deal. Burgess says, yeah, all right. And the publisher says, oh, I also need a picture for the back of the book. Burgess says, all right. So him and his girlfriend at the time, who later became his wife, they go out and drive to Beaudley. And they want to get a nice picture with a nice background of Beaudley. But they get confused. They get lost. The nighttime is coming. The light is going. And they say, screw it. Let's just take a picture here, wherever we are. They pull over. They take a picture. And they realize it's Pontypool. So... The author says to himself, I owe Pontypool a book. So that's why we get Pontypool Changes Everything, the book. That's why we get Pontypool, the radio drama. That's why we get Pontypool, the film. That's why we're going to get Pontypool 2 and Pontypool 3 and the whole Pontypool trilogy. It all comes from this guy, 
not being able to take a picture in Beaudley. I cannot express this enough. I hated reading Pontypool Changes Everything. I liked the concept, I liked some of the characters, and I was okay with the nonlinear fragmentary setup. This book is under 300 pages, but I felt like I was reading for a thousand pages because I had to keep rereading it to understand what the hell the author was talking about. Why, you ask? It has what I consider to be some of the absolute worst writing I've ever experienced from a book that is supposedly really, really well done. The overwriting makes you have to reread paragraphs over and over and over again. Okay, this is an example of what I'm talking about here. A tomato was told to keep all of the events of her life before the stroke beneath the sheen of its skin. It was obedient. In her tomato, in one of its tiny translucent seeds, Ellen has every plot of land she ever sold. Stored there are her various machines for telling the future. I have no idea what this tomato represents. I, I just don't. It was just so exhausting. Shakespeare is far easier to read and understand. There's like a 20 page stretch where every single line needs a goddamn metaphor. I've never experienced anything like this before. To me it's always been, here's the setup, here's the metaphor, here's the thing coming at you, la la la. But it's really a metaphor for metaphors that keep hunting you long after they've been meaningful. That is exhausting to try and figure out what this guy is even talking about. But with all that being said, I like the way that Burgess does things and the fact that he tries to do things that he's never done before. He tries to do things where he's actually convinced that he has no idea what he's doing. He likes to challenge himself and see what he can actually do. That's kind of how the screenplay of Pontypool came to be. The film Pontypool, directed by Bruce McDonald, is about a radio host who barricades himself inside a station and tells the people about the virus. So I was a little confused at this point because I had read the book and the movie its logline was a little bit different from the book. Actually, it's a lot different because you're taking a character that's this big in the book and you're making him the whole centerpiece of the film. So I was confused. So I'm a little angry because I hated the book, but at the same time, I've heard from the horror community that Pontypool is a really good film. So I cleanse my palate a little bit, I refresh, and I think about all the wonderful radio DJs we get in horror films. How'd you kill your mother? Ever find yourself being completely smothered by somebody? All right, you guys, this is what you're going to do, okay? Well, stay up with me, and I'll figure out some way to keep you occupied. And then I'm ready to experience Pontypool. You've also learned that some of the perpetrators are speaking in bizarre ways. They're babbling in ways that no one understands. We don't know if this is a way uh, of trying to terrorize people. We don't know. The pace in this film is exceptional. Films that take place in one location, for the most part, usually have a lull somewhere in the middle. This has no lull, no downtime. You are constantly in it. You're dialed into the dialogue. You're dialed into the dynamics between the technician, the producer, and the on-air talent. Shit, you're dialed into the close-ups, the wrinkles on Grant's face, the pain and the expressions the producer makes when Mazzy goes off script, the small looks of awe in the technician. And above all else, you are absolutely mesmerized by all the things you hear but do not see. And really, this is the separation for horror lovers who like this film versus some who don't like this film. It's all about that, are you scared by what you don't see or are you scared by what you do see? You are in a world of confusion, just like our protagonists, unsure of what to make of everything. You enjoy the bizarreness of each character you see, and you warm up to them instantly. These are strong characters. They're all likable, and you root for them, even if there are power struggles within the context of the radio show. This has the same sort of feel as Signs from M. Night Shyamalan, where you have something happening on a much larger scale than what we actually get to see. It has obvious shades of Orson Welles' War of the Worlds, and it has many similarities to the podcast Welcome to Night Vale. Originally, the concept for the film was just going to be the wavering lines like the beginning of the film, as Tony Burgess reads the script and the audience can hear Sidney and Laurel Ann in the background. I'm glad they chose to expand that. So why does the film work so well and the novel is such shit? First off, the concept of the novel is great. It's the execution that lacks. It has several characters, but none that stay throughout the whole thing. It's cut into two parts, which might as well be two completely separate novellas circling around the virus. It's almost the same structure as the film In Fabric, which feels like two acts as opposed to a normal three. The film keeps everything extraordinarily simple in its execution. 
unlike the book, which is absolutely all frickin' over the place. Did I mention that in the book there's a character named Helen, a character named Ellen, and a character named capital H slash Ellen? That's right, I'm sure I know he did it on purpose, but what's the purpose? That is just brutal to a reader. And I'm also still trying to figure out what the metaphor of the tomato is. I have no idea. So while the book has extreme randomness and follows storylines with abrupt endings, but not in a suspenseful way, the film has characters played by actors and actresses with absolute charisma. The chemistry between Grant and Sidney shines, and that's not surprising considering actors Stephen McHattie and Lisa Hewell are married. The movie is better than the book because it takes all of Burgess's terrible metaphors and confusing descriptive imagery and puts it in the trash where it belongs. A movie strips away everything written that is not needed, and a majority of that short book is not needed. Now I'm talking a lot of crap about the author, but realistically I'm just talking about the book. I actually do think he's a very interesting guy and a lot of the things that he's done and put out from books and films and music are really interesting. I like his style, but as much as I hate his book, I love the script that he creates for Pontypool. It's the exact opposite of the fragmented, non-linear style, which is one of the main reasons it works so well. The book aims to shock you with weirdness, and it does. The movie aims to do something entirely different, and thank you for that, Mr. Author. Although one thing I don't like about the film is Dr. Mendez. He comes off like this weird... He almost feels like he should be next to Ray in Schitt's Creek. It, it just comes off weird. It doesn't work for me. It's... The tone is wrong. The actors are listed in the end credits first, which I think is phenomenal, even though Bruce McDonald did an amazing job directing. This film does not work without the actors being so good. It reminded me a lot of James Whale, what he did with Frankenstein. I highly recommend seeing this film, especially if you're the horror goer who doesn't need to see everything. The performances are fantastic, the direction, dialogue, and pacing are top tier. Don't sleep on this one if you haven't seen it yet. You can put this book-film combo in the same category as Stephen King's Doctor Sleep versus Mike Flanagan's movie version. Every now and then, it doesn't happen often, but every now and then, the movie is better than the book. Much better. And let me just say, Burgess doesn't even love his own novel. He's got huge issues with it. The book has nothing to do with the book in some, in some ways. The book is kind of randomly related to itself. Did you know there's going to be two sequels to Pontypool? Well, let me break down exactly what these sequels will represent. The first Pontypool is everything that happens inside the radio station. Pontypool 2 is everything that happens simultaneously to the first film, but outside of the radio station. Basically, Pontypool 2 is going to be the book, Pontypool Changes Everything. Pontypool 3 is the aftermath. The virus has broken the structure of all reality. In closing, here are my thoughts. Not a big fan of Pontypool Changes Everything, the book. Huge fan of Pontypool, the movie. Very excited about Pontypool 2 and Pontypool 3 and how it will actually be from the book, Pontypool Changes Everything. It's going to be an actual adaptation this time, in theory. And, although I don't like the writing style of Tony Burgess when it comes to his book, I've only read one of them, that book, I am a huge fan of the way he conducts himself. I'm a huge fan of the way he pulls stories out of what he's done in life. Drug-induced, yeah, very, very dangerous stuff, and these nightmarish visions that he's having, all that, but also, I love that he can take those experiences and put them into short stories long stories, novels, whatever style, films as well. I love how he conducts himself. I love that he was in the middle of nowhere in Canada and decided he wanted to do plays. So he starred in Oklahoma and all these other plays just because he'd never done it before and wanted to know what it felt like. And he just, he wanted to keep himself busy. I love that he writes screenplays that end up being these no budget films that are 90 minutes long and they just come out on VOD, and you might even have no idea they exist, but he just keeps making these films. They keep coming out and out and out, and Homie has an idea, and he just runs with it. He has an idea and knows he can't do certain things, or doesn't know how to do certain things, so he goes straight at it. I mean, how often do people want to do something, but come up with 100,000 excuses not to do it? He does the opposite of that. 
And I think that's fantastic. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. This is all over the place, but that's exactly how my mind was working while reading all this fragmented, non-linear stuff that Tony Burgess has brought to my brain. Hope everyone is doing well and staying safe out there, and we'll see you next time. Beep.